Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third um, Freedom School lecture series where we're discussing Home Sweet Home. Um, this lecture series has been co-sponsored by the Department of African American Studies at Georgia State University and Auburn Avenue Research Library. Thus far this semester, this we have held two talks and this will be our third talk um, featuring Professor Tanya Washington. Her talk is entitled Fighting for Home Sweet Home. This is the third chapter according to our flyers. On November 20th, next Friday, we will also have another Freedom School lecture featuring the chair of the Department of African American Studies, Jonathan Gales, who will be talking about weaponization of the black masculine body. Um, same time, 7 p.m. on Dr. Gales talk. Again, we would like to thank the Auburn Avenue Research Library for co-sponsoring this event with us and for broadcasting the web webinar series. Um, again, we will continue to have this Freedom School series, not only this semester, but we also have a number of speakers scheduled for next semester as well. Um, the importance and the purpose of the Freedom School series follows in a tradition and a history of Freedom Schools in the Black community, and that is to inform and to talk about and discuss political issues that impact the Black community. And so we wanted to make sure that we have that community connection between GSU, Auburn Avenue Research Library, and our Green Atlanta um, community. Tonight, I have the honor and the privilege of in introducing Professor Tanya Washington. Professor Washington is a professor of law at Georgia State University College of Law. She earned her JD from the University of Maryland School of Law and then clerked for Associate Judge Robert M. Bell on the Maryland Court of Appeals. After practicing as a toxic tort defense litigator in the Baltimore office of Piper and Marbury, she completed two fellowships and earned her LM, LLM from Harvard Law School. Professor Washington has taught civil procedure one and two, family law, education law and race and law at Georgia State for the past 17 years. Her research and scholarship focus on issues related to educational equity, domestic violence, racial justice, inclusion and diversity, marriage equality, and children's constitutional rights. Her articles and op-eds have been published in law journals and periodicals across the nation, and Supreme Court Justice Kennedy cited her co-authored amicus brief in his majority opinion in the landmark marriage equality decision a Berger Fell v. Hodges. Professor Washington considers herself to be an activist scholar and a belief that the true value of the law lies in its capacity to improve the human condition and it animates her work. She served for three years on the Atlanta Human Relations Commission, volunteered with various organizations that provide support to Atlanta's unsheltered population. She has cooked and served at area soup kitchens, filed several amicus briefs in Georgia appellate cases and in federal circuit and US Supreme Court cases and provided countless hours of pro bono work. Her work as an educator activist also includes serving for two years as director of the John Lewis Fellowship Program, a humanitarian action program funded by a grant to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights from the Mellon Foundation. Professor Washington's teaching and scholarly contributions have been recognized by the Gate City Bar with the President's Award for Excellence and by Georgia State University with the Alumni Distinguished Faculty Award for Teaching and Scholarship. Without further ado, I have the privilege of introducing Professor Tanya Washington. Can I... Some, somebody has to let me start my video. <laughs> well, there you are. You should be able to start now. Okay. Yay. Hi, Dr. Hi. Bailey. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm so glad to be here. And I am going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Please let me know. Is it visible? Yes, I can see Excellent. it. Wonderful. Um, just, I just want to say thank you to Auburn Research Library. Um, to the Department of African American Studies at Georgia State and to Dr. Bennett Bailey and the other organizers of the Freedom School program. It really is an honor to be here 
um, tonight to have an opportunity to share uh, one personal example that I think has universal significance for how gentrification um, is playing out in the city of Atlanta. So before I jump into um, the personal story that involves my neighbors and me, um, I want to start with some just background. So we all know that Atlanta is referred to um, as the Black Mecca. Um, I don't know how many folks saw this billboard. There was one stationed uh, south of Atlanta and one um, north of Atlanta, but it described a reality that a lot of people were experiencing and observing, but uh, a reality that few people would admit and acknowledge. And uh, the reality is that the population of Black people in Atlanta has been steadily declining since 1970. And more recently, uh, that decline has been accelerated um, by uh, rapid gentrification of what were historically Black neighborhoods. So let's look at some statistics uh, that confirm the reality of gentrification in the Black Mecca. Um, so for 2017, 2018, and now 2019, um, Atlanta has been uh, judged to be the most unequal city in the United States. Um, in Atlanta, the rich make 19.2 times more than the poor. And so the only conclusion that I can draw from this is the um, Citadel of Civil Rights, which is Atlanta's civic identity, is suffering from staggering uh, inequality. And a lot of that inequality manifests in um, significant housing disparities and housing insecurity. Atlanta is ranked the fourth fastest gentrifying city in the United States. That's as of uh, 2018. Um, when we look at uh, cities across the nation, um, the highest uh, rates of income inequality, wage inequality, economic segregation, and rising housing costs, Atlanta is second to uh, Washington, D.C., which is actually where I am from. Um, and so we're topping all of these lists that we don't necessarily want to be on. Um, Atlanta is averaging 800 evictions per week. And this, this statistic was a 2019 statistic, but it was a statistic uh, that tracked eviction rates before the pandemic. Um, and so in the midst of a pandemic, we see that the rate of evictions um, is increasing, um, accelerating even more. And unfortunately, um, you know, most of these evictions, the lion's share of evictions across the nation are um, black women and children. And if you drive around Atlanta, you can bear witness to an exploding population of unsheltered people, families living under bridges and in darkened corners of our city. And it's tragic and it appears to be increasing in the midst of a pandemic. So let's talk about what is gentrification. So we're using, um, we're using the, the term and understanding uh, what it actually means. I wanna talk about what it is, what it looks like and how it happens. So it has been referred to as urban renewal or urban removal. Um, some people refer to it as progress. Um, some people uh, 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 track it according to economic development or see it as a uh, casualty uh, of economic development. Um, but what we see is changing demographics based on race and class. Um, in Atlanta, gentrification looks a little different because we have so many transplants that still find um, housing in Atlanta affordable compared to housing in New York and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and Oakland and other parts of the country. But for those of us who work here, the housing costs are often out of reach. Um, and for the working poor, um, the, they are out of reach. Um, we also see uh, gentrification being justified in, uh, in terms of neighborhood improvement, that we want to improve our neighborhoods. And so 
we are improving parts of the city that may be run down, may lack infrastructure. My response to that is why can't we make those improvements for the people who reside there? Why must we make those um, improvements for a new demographic to move into? So let's talk about how gentrification presents. And I love this picture. This is an actual mural off of um, Forsyth Street, right next to the Rialto Theater. Someone painted it. And it's a, a picture of a moving truck. Um, the white neighbors holding the cat. Uh, the children are moving in to Vine City. And the black neighbors who live there and are indigenous to that neighborhood are looking at their, their new neighbors. And this is happening in Vine City. It's happening in People's Town. It has already happened in places like Kirkwood and it is happening in neighborhoods, other neighborhoods of the West End. And it is um, prevalent. I mean, if you drive through the neighborhoods, you start to see the complexion of the residents changing quite rapidly. Um, what it looks like is often improved infrastructure. Um, sidewalks are fixed. Lighting is improved, um, fiber optic wire is laid, streets are repaired, um, flooding is addressed. So we see all of these real uh, improvements. And the question is, if we had the resources to do this when the neighborhood is changing, why could we not have done it for the original residents indigenous to that area? We also see um, the proliferation of charter schools in areas that are gentrifying. We see the closing of public school, traditional public schools that makes way for charter schools to move into these um, gentrifying neighborhoods. We see new neighborhood associations. Very often the new neighbors will create their own association that has happened in People's Town rather than join the existing neighborhood association. And that creates a fissure or a, a chasm actually between the old neighbors, the original legacy residents and the new neighbors who are moving in. Um, and we see uh, affluent and more educated neighbors replacing less affluent neighbors. Um, and so it's a confluence of race and class. Um, and we also see more upscale amenities. We see parks and playgrounds and other attractive amenities that original residents would have loved to have had access to, but don't come until there's a change a pending change in uh, the demographics. And how gentrification happens, I think this is really important because this is, uh, gentrification is not accidental. It is a, a, a incredibly intentional and it happens in a very strategic and predictable way. So we have changes to zoning laws that occur that allow for certain different kinds of construction to take place in a neighborhood. And these zoning um, committee meetings that pre-pandemic were held at City Hall, many people did not go and they didn't realize that the ordinances that were being voted on that allowed for changes to zoning laws were going to facilitate um, gentrification. And so we need to be aware of that and we need to pay attention when um, people, developers petition for changes to zoning ordinances in our neighborhoods. Um, housing incentives, there are programs that incentivize moving into certain houses, uh, certain neighborhoods, excuse me. Um, they can take the form of down payment assistance or tax abatements for a certain period of years. And that is, these are, this is a tool that is used to attract a different kind of resident um, to a particular neighborhood. HUD violations by property owners that want to be able to rent their property for more money. Um, we see this in People's Town after the sale of uh, Turner Field, what used to be Turner Field where the Atlanta Braves played to Georgia State University. We saw um, activity among uh, HUD property owners such that they would not make certain repairs um, purposefully uh, fail certain tests that would uh, qualify them to continue as a HUD property owner for the purpose of being able to rent um, units at, mar at market rate, which is significantly more than what they were making under um, HUD 
uh, rental restrictions. We also see an increase in code enforcement activity. And this one is, is particularly interesting. I have seen um, the number of violations increase significantly in my neighborhood for housing conditions that were acceptable for 10, 15, 20 years. And then as newer residents move in, we see an increased presence of code enforcement and more citations being issued. And these will be, uh, these citations will be issued for things like a downed fence, or you need a new roof, um, or um, what they consider to be too much um, personal property in the yard. And some of these things are quite expensive to repair. I mean, a new roof can be anywhere from six to ten. To, $10,000, code enforcement may give you 30 days to come up with that amount of money in order to um, bring the, the um, quality of the property up to code. And attendant to that is the insurance company reviews that lead to foreclosures down at the bottom of the list. Um, I was not aware of this as a strategy, but when I started going to um, community meetings in my neighborhood, I was hearing different people, often elderly neighbors, talking about notices that they were getting from their insurance companies, and they all had different insurers. And the notices would say, um, we're going to come by and we're going to do a walk around your property to make sure that it is insurable, that it meets the standards for us to provide insurance for it, which is required by your mortgage company. And again, they will focus on things like a downed fence or a, a roof that may be in need of repair. And they will give a resident maybe 30, maybe 60, maybe 90 days to repair those things. And if the resident is unable to do so because some of these repairs are expensive, what they will do is they will cancel the insurance policy, which then triggers foreclosure by the mortgage company. And the fact that this was happening, that so many people were reporting this in the same neighborhood with different insurers means that they are acting in concert. And it was also tracking um, the rapid gentrification of the neighborhood. So I observed this and then started doing some research um, to, to find out that it is actually a play out of the gentrification handbook. So that's why it's on the screen. Um, increase in property taxes, people are being taxed out of the neighborhood. My property taxes went from $1,200 one year to $6,000 the next year to $8,900 the following year. So in two years, it went from $1,200 to $8,900, right? Which divided by 12, you know, is a substantial increase in your um, mortgage, right? Because it's the what you owe the mortgage company plus the property taxes. A lot of people cannot absorb that kind of an increase. Um, and th these are significant increases um, that are forcing people out because they can't pay the taxes. And we also see a number of people losing their homes because they can't uh, pay the taxes and investors buying these houses, these properties up just for the cost of the taxes. Um, the increase in rent often is because of the increase in property taxes that the renter, uh, the property owner, has to pay, and they pass that on to the renters. And so we see a lot of, we saw a lot of renters in my neighborhood who could no longer afford the rent um, when their uh, lease came to an end. And then finally, eminent domain, um, which is the story of my neighbors and my struggle against the city of Atlanta. It is the most aggressive tool that is used um, to displace people and to facilitate gentrification. And what I found troubling um, was a New York Times article that was published in March, 2020. And uh, Atlanta was specifically mentioned as one of the cities that the Trump administration's Army Corps of Engineers uh, reached out to. And the transaction um, is an exchange uh, from the Army Corps of en Engineers and the administration of support for infrastructure projects. So they will help with the engineering, the design, and some of the financing of um, infrastructure projects. And in exchange for that, 
the cities agree to use eminent domain to evict the people who live in the places where they need to do these, where they want to do these infrastructure projects. And that is incredibly, that's a very troubling transaction. And so I will put in the chat um, during the Q&A, the article, the actual article, because I want people to read it. One of the reasons I am telling people my story is because there is a pattern and practice to how this happens. And I want people to recognize the signs. Um, and to be able to um, pr protect themselves um, and res respond and resist when they see that this is happening to them or their neighbors and their community. So I live in People's Town, which is still, I think, a historic Black neighborhood in Atlanta. Um, it is southeast of downtown and um, Turner Field, now Georgia State's stadium sits in Summerhill, which is right adjacent to People's Town. And People's Town is between Hank Aaron, where the stadium is, and Grant Park, uh, where the zoo is. So it is quite a valuable, um, it contains some very valuable property that is very close to all the interstates, conveniently located to downtown without having to get on the highway, and a really great neighborhood. This is my house, which I love um, a lot. I moved in um, with my son when I was a single mom. That was about nine years ago. And I moved in, my neighbor, my um, cousin lives two doors up. I had friends um, in the neighborhood who I would visit. In fact, that's how I came to uh, discover the house and um, wanted to live in a neighborhood that was still a real place. You know, there were um, kids playing in the street, um, people sitting on their porches waving to you as you pass by, just a really great place. And um, when I bought it, you know, I, I had no idea that it was going to present um, a set of experiences that has really changed my life. So I wanna just say a little bit about eminent domain law in Georgia, because I also want, again, I want people to understand what their rights are. I want them to understand what eminent domain is and how to respond to it within the context of the law. Um, it just so happened that I am a law professor. And um, even though this is not my area of law, I do know legal research. And so when I first heard that the city was going to try to use eminent domain to take my house and the other houses on our block, I started to do some research. I do wanna say at the outset that in 2012, I moved in in um, 2010, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2011. In 2012, there was flooding in People's Town. A lot of the neighborhoods downstream from the stadium, um, which contain uh, areas that are have been paved over as uh, for parking lots, a lot of the neighborhoods downstream from the stadium flood. And part of the flooding, and I'll talk about this a little later in my presentation, the flooding um, is caused by so much asphalt and so little permeable space around the stadium. And so when they paved over those parking lots, they created um, a flooding issue. And then that flooding issue is being used to facilitate displacement and gentrification. So often what we see is a cycle of neglect and then predatory use of law to displace people under the auspices of correcting problems that were created by the neglect. So a number of my neighbors, there were 27 people on the block, nine people sued the city of Atlanta and they didn't want to, they didn't want the city to buy their houses. What they wanted was the city to fix the flooding. Um, the city told them as part of their negotiations, um, we're giving you these offers. If you don't accept them, you're gonna lose your house to eminent domain because we plan to take the entire block. The rest of us were not part of the lawsuit because our houses did not flood in 2012. And so there was no, we had no standing as we call it in the law, we had no reason or justification to participate. And so we were just sitting there watching what was happening um, and, and alarmed because we were gonna be affected by it, but we couldn't 
um, participate in the negotiations. And so what I did when I heard that this, this was the city's intent um, was to research eminent domain law in Georgia. I had not studied this area of law for 20 years and that was when I was studying for the bar. Um, I did not know that it was still a real thing that really happened to people. So I wasn't, you know, this came out of nowhere. And my thought is if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. If it can happen in people's town, it can happen anywhere. <clears throat> Georgia actually has a property owner's bill of rights, which is unique among states that offers some procedural protections for property owners. Um, again, eminent domain is not about have you paid your mortgage, have you paid your rent. Eminent domain is the constitutional authority of a state entity uh, or a uh, governmental entity at the local, state, or federal level to take your property for a public purpose and give you just compensation. And just compensation does not mean what you would like to get for your property. It often means the least that they can pay you uh, when they take your property. So um, before they're, before an entity is authorized to do that under the Georgia Property Owners Bill of Rights, the entity is required to meet certain notification and hearing requirements, none of which the city of Atlanta engaged in. Um, the Georgia law also prohibits using um, eminent domain for economic development. There are places, there are, are states throughout the United States where a shopping mall is defined as a public purpose purpose that would justify taking people's property, um, a park. Um, in other places like Georgia, uh, infrastructure is often the most cited justification uh, for taking public property and in a, a person's property. And in this instance, the city is citing um, flood mitigation as its justification. Um, there's also the protection of a 20 year statute of limitation uh, limitations that's triggered by the uh, use of eminent domain. So if the city sues a property owner and takes their property by eminent domain and doesn't use it for the stated purposes for 20 years, then the property owner has a cause of action against the city and can get their land back. Um, most people don't challenge the taking they just litigate the just compensation. And part of the reason that they don't challenge the taking is because the entity, and in this case, the city of Atlanta is presumed to have a public purpose. Um, there are short filing timelines and restrictive, a very restrictive appellate process. Um, it's very expensive to find lawyers and engineering experts to help you make the substantive and procedural arguments that you would need, need to make to challenge the taking effectively. And so most, most people don't challenge the taking. It's expensive and the chances of prevailing are slim to none. Um, I suspected and later confirmed that the city did not need the property that they took. And so I was um, blessed to find an attorney willing to fight for me, to find engineers willing to fight for us, me and my neighbors. And, um, but that's not, the, that's not the normal case. I understand that I am privileged as a law professor to have had access to a network of people and to have a job that inspired people to take a chance on me. And despite all of those advantages, I'm still at a disadvantage with respect to the city. So the reality is the average person doesn't stand a chance when the city decides that they're going to take property by eminent domain. That does not mean that all hope is lost. There are some strategic things that can be done. I would do some things differently um, if I knew then what I know now. And that's what I wanna share with folks when I tell this story. I also wanna highlight that um, Blight in Georgia is now a justification for eminent domain. And this is particularly disturbing because one man's blight is another man's status quo. So the definition of blight is vacuous, it's culture, um, it's culture specific. 
um, and what constitutes blight can change as a result of gentrification. And so um, this is a new addition to Georgia law within the past three or four years that is going to put um, a lot more property owned by folks um, to make that property vulnerable to an imminent domain taking. Okay, so after the flooding um, in 2014, the city commissioned uh, a plan by outside engineers. They gave them all of the information about the area, the topography, the flooding, how it, you know, how it occurs, how often it occurs, when it occurs. And in response to the city's request for a commission plan to address the flooding, there was a report produced that said, put the park and pond or put a park and pond next to the stadium where the flooding occurs. And so you can see in the map, um, the uh, wet pond or detention pond that's right outside of the stadium. And again, they were, uh, the commission plan was explicit that the um, floodwaters accumulated as a result of the um, paved areas around the stadium. And that if they wanted to address flooding downstream from that, not just in people's town, but in other areas, capture the water where it pools. It's also more environmentally sustainable to do that, which they also mentioned in the report, because this water is just rainwater, which you could repurpose and use for gardens and other things. Under my block is a stormwater sewage system. There's a, a pipe that's large enough for you to run, uh, for you to drive an 18 wheeler through. And so this is a map of my block. Underneath it is this huge pipe and it contains a, you know, a mix of uh, stormwater and sewage water. And so you can't repurpose water that has sewage in it. Right, And as you see these ponds, although it looks pretty in the picture, um, what I continue to say in the media and in response to this proposed plan by the city is you want to create an open sewer in the middle of a residential neighborhood. You want to create poop parks and ponds that, are, um, that emit a smell and attract bugs and that do not belong in the middle of a residential area. All around this block are homes. Uh, our block is at the heart of People's Town. And you see they have a plan for three, um, three ponds. There's a waterfall where my house is in the lower left-hand corner. And this plan was gonna displace 27 families and homes. Now, I found this curious because the city owned the property around Turner Field. So my question is why not use the property you already own, build the parks, park and ponds there where the water pools and, uh, and where the water originates, the floodwaters originate and where the water can be repurposed. Why would you displace 27 families and homes and put ponds on a block that are essentially gonna function as open sewers? And they said, oh no, you know, when there's a stormwater overflow and there's sewage in the ponds, we'll come out and clean it up, which essentially means dumping chemicals into these ponds so that um, you can address the smell. And I guess to neutralize the bacteria that would be growing therein. So to me, this was just a bad and unnecessary plan. Um, and it certainly was a departure from what was recommended by the um, by the engineering firm that the city commissioned. So these are my neighbors who I adore. Um, some of them are no longer on the block. Um, Mr. Darden and his wife, Mrs. Darden, um, and I sh share an attorney. Um, and Mrs. Maddie, who has uh, earned her wings earlier this year, uh, lived on the other block, and I'm, I'm going to talk about her in, in a few moments because she's, she's a very special lady. Um, Miss Maddie has been a community activist or was a community activist for over 50 years. She lived in that neighborhood for over 50 years, raised four generations of children there, carried the torch in the Olympics, 
Um, she just has a legacy that um, anyone should be proud of. And yet her house was on the chopping block and was one of the 27 homes that the city targeted for, um, for displacement. This is what it looks like. This is what it looked like from my kitchen window when they would tear the houses down. So these are perfect, perfectly habitable homes. Um, sometimes a, a reporter would call me and say, hey, they're planning to tear down a house today so I could kind of prepare myself for it. But often you would just wake up to hear the sound of um, a house being demolished. And it's incredibly violent and you're just disappearing people. They left the trees for the park um, but there were uh, 11 houses between me and my neighbors, the Dartons. I'm the first house on Atlanta Avenue. They're the last house on Atlanta Avenue on our block. And now they're my next door neighbor because all of those 11 houses are gone. Um, these were homes that people had lived in for um, decades. There were new neighbors who had just moved in and renovated the houses. There was a, a real mix of people on the block um, but now there are five. And um, it, I just want, I, I, I use this picture in my presentation because I really want people to see and appreciate the violence of, of this process. So we decided we were gonna fight. Um, we had uh, tremendous support from the Housing Justice League um, from Georgia Stand Up, from a number of other housing organizations, from their membership, from community um, folks who are just opposed to, um, you know, what was being done to us in our community. And we protested, you know, this was initiated by former Mayor uh, Kasim Reed. Um, we protested, we were at City Hall, we were on the radio, we were on television, we had you know, uh, two Guardian articles, lots of AJC coverage, all the television networks were, were, um, were um, covering this story. Uh, we took advantage of every holiday. We had a happy Thanksgiving campaign where we put uh, Mayor Reed's head on a turkey on a paper plate and marched down to City Hall to tell him that we were not, um, we weren't going to be moved. We did a home for the holidays and we delivered a, a bag of coal and an open records request to his office. Um, we just made it clear that we were not going to go quietly in the night. And I, I felt like the strategy was for this to happen without anybody knowing it. So we made sure that everybody knew it. And meanwhile, the city was sending us letters, threatening, intimidating letters saying, if you don't move, then we're going to initiate um, legal proceedings against you. What I knew because I had done the research was that I had more protection and that we would have more protection if we allowed them to sue us because then at least they would have to use the property for the stated purpose um, within that 20 year statute of limitation. So, you know, my attitude was sue me already. Let's just, let's, let's go to court um, if that's what you're going to do. But I, I'm not, and my neighbors and I agreed, we're not going down without a fight. So our protests continued. And then one day we went to visit Mayor Reed. We were demanding a meeting with him. He informed that he would meet with Ms. Maddie, but he would not meet with the rest of us. And he would not meet with us together, citing concerns about confidentiality. I informed him that any rights to confidentiality belong to us and we were prepared to waive them so that we could meet together because we recognized the divide and conquer strategy. Um, and as we were, um, so we left his office to decide how we were gonna handle it. Um, Ms. Maddie was adamant that she did not wanna meet with him by herself. Um, as we were walking back in to let him know what our decision was, he came running out and said, "Miss Maddie, Miss Maddie, you can stay. I've decided you can stay in your house for as long as you want. My son, who I think was 11 at the time, um, was with me and he was standing behind us um, and we were cheering and crying. You know, we were just so happy for Miss Maddie because we had seen the toll that it was taking on her. She was 93 at the time and it was incredibly stressful for a woman who has spent her life serving others to have to spend her final days fighting to stay in her home. 
Um, so we were really happy for her. My son leans forward and whispers to me, so what about the rest of us? Which of course is what all of us were thinking. Um, the mayor turned on his heels and walked back into his office and uh, made clear that the rest of us still had to go. So we um, started having She Stays, We Stay campaigns. Um, that's me in the front next to Miss Maddie um, holding my belly. At this point, I am six months pregnant and we decided we were gonna camp out on the steps of City Hall and then go into the mayor's office to ask him uh, for a meeting and to demand that he make the same exemption for us that he made for our um, neighbor. We were happy for her. We thought it was the right decision. We just wanted to um, wanted it to be extended to the rest of us. When we did get a meeting with um, Mayor Reed, he looked me in the eye and I'll never forget the way he said it with all the hubris um, that he's known for. He said, I decided to let Miss Maddie stay in her house because that's what I wanted to do. Um, which is inconsistent with eminent domain law. It's not about who the person is who owns the property, it's about whether the property is necessary for the proposed public purpose that justifies the taking. And it was hard for the, the city to make a credible argument that Miss Maddie's home was not necessary when it was located in the middle of the block, but our homes that bookended Atlanta Avenue were necessary. And so I was, I was like, okay, that's gonna be a problem for the city in court because you've just made an exemption that is not consistent with how eminent domain law applies. We wouldn't leave, so they sued us. Um, we just celebrated our four year anniversary of the lawsuit, October 31st, 2016. There's nothing scarier than somebody taking your house. And I want people to understand what it looks, what, how it actually operates. They took our names off the deed to our property. We still have been paying our mortgages for the past four years, but we are essentially, you know, living in these homes that the city owns. Um, the city put a certain amount in escrow with the court. So they put it in a bank account with the court. For me, they appraised my home at $350,000, which is the, the house across the street sold for $650 a couple week, um, months ago, right? So they didn't even give me enough to move across the street. They put the money in escrow. If you try to take that money to use it for litigation, you foreclose the right to fight, right? So the law is structured to disincentivize even trying to challenge the taking um, if you can find a lawyer and engineers to help you do so. So we found a lawyer and engineers, and it was on one. Um, we were in court for years and requesting documents from the city um, because the linchpin question, as I've said, is necessity. Is this necessary for flood mitigation? Um, we found an email from a uh, a former city of Atlanta engineer who was the project manager for this particular project. Um, she oversaw the project and she wrote these words in an email that we found. Uh, the city doesn't have technical data to support the proposed land acquisition and the proposed design underway. And that was found in 2013 before the city of Atlanta began to taking and demolishing homes. And I really wanna play this clip for you because I want you to hear it from her. I tell my students, you never find emails like this. This is the proverbial smoking gun, right? It speaks directly to the question of necessity. And it is, um, it only leaves room for the conclusion that it wasn't necessary. So let me play this. Um, Lakita, please let me know if um, you can see my screen. Can you see that? Um, no, I still have your um, image. Okay, from the so I'm gonna house. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and then just share the video screen so you'll see that. And let me know if that can you see that? Yes. Excellent. Good morning to uh, CUC Board Chair Matt Sickens, um, to the Board Chair members, including my City Council member that in her absence. Um, my name is Kimberly Scott, formerly Palmer. I am a West End Historic District uh, resident, as well as a former city of Atlanta employee. Um, as you may be aware, um, at, or if not, 
I am the engineer and project manager uh, that during the discovery period, the emails actually sparked a re-review of this case, as well as uh, getting us to the point where we are right now um, and looking to overturn the eminent domain uh, ordinance and uh, condemnation uh, processes that are in place. Um, I would like to appeal right now to the true public servants uh, that uh, are my former colleagues that worked with me uh, on this project, as well as in the Department of Watershed Management. Um, being a resident of West End, as well as a Atlanta native, um, I am a proud graduate of Frederick Douglass High School under the Center for Engineering um, uh, technology uh, department that included a magnet program for engineers and those that were interested in going to engineering. And I am a graduate of Vanderbilt University uh, with a degree in chemical engineering. So the credentials are there. So we don't want to really go into the specifics of trying to discount that. But I did have an opportunity and really wanted to make sure that the engineering data was in place for the city to make a decision on whether or not the pond footprint would be expanded. Um, when we were working on the project, it included taking care of the principal homes that experienced some severe flooding during that time. Um, and we did not have sufficient engineering data from our engineering consultants to go from three to four homes where you had the severe flooding to displace an, an entire block. So right now, we really want the city to be able to right a wrong. Um, when I came in and with my credentials, I was raised professionally by African-American engineer that taught me to design with a moral compass. Um, that moral compass meant that when you design, you design as if you live there. You design as if this is impacting your neighborhood, your street. And that's how I have worked um, with the city of Atlanta as a private consultant and will continue to work. And I'm appealing once again to my colleagues that somebody you know, said to me, thank you, Kim, for doing the right thing when no one was looking. Um, I know a lot of people talk about corruption in the city of Atlanta, but there's some great work that's being done by some engineers and um, geologists and people of technical backgrounds, people with non-technical backgrounds that's doing some really good work. And I think you need to be applauded for your work, but I also think that this is an opportunity in a culture where it's, it can be very political. Engineering work can be very political, as well as where you are told not to put things in writing. You know, this is a time for you to right or wrong. This is a time for you to look at this and say, at that time, we did not have sufficient data to move forward with condemnation legislation that would displace an entire block. This is the time for you to reconsider the engineering data that has been provided right now and look at a redesign that will keep these residents in their homes, as well as, and I would like to add, to not undermine the structural integrity of their homes. Uh, we know that sometimes people can be condescending with their promises, and we don't want an engineering design that you put in place that will take away from the structural integrity of their home. So I'm asking the city once again, and I'm appealing to my fellow colleagues, those that have worked with me in the community, as well as the city hall, to reconsider this legislation, keep these people in their homes, as well as to look at the redesign and make sure that it's a win-win for everybody. I appreciate your time. Thank you. So I wanted to share that, um, and I'm gonna go back to my, uh, PowerPoint slide. I wanted to share that because it was clear. Um, can you see the slides? Or are you still? Yes. Okay. Uh, that slides. Great. Thank you. Um, it was it was clear that that this wasn't necessary. Um, we did not anticipate finding this information, but there it was because this engineer who was responsible for signing off on the project decided to document her concerns. The person to whom she uh, submitted this email has subsequently been um, indicted, um, I believe it was 2019 for bribery. Uh, that, that was the Department of Watershed Commissioner Joanna Macrina. And the bribery had take, was taking place at the same time 
that they were um, settling with my neighbors to move. And many of them negotiated a settlement against the backdrop of a threat that if you don't move, we're going to take it anyway. So I would love to be able to say the story ended here, right? We found the email, dramatic ending, um, and the city says, no, we're not going to pursue this. That's not what happened. Um, we continue to fight. And in uh, February, it will be eight years. It will be four years since we were sued, but there were four years leading up to the lawsuit that we were fighting. And we are committed to this fight. Um, our rallying cry is we shall not be moved. We sing it at every one of our protests and rallies. And um, just on a, you know, a historical note, I know 50 years ago, if I had even hesitated when somebody said move, there would have been hell to pay. We've got Rosewood, we've got Tulsa, we've got a whole lot of examples about what happens when somebody stands and resists, but I draw strength from the ancestors for those who couldn't resist, who couldn't say no without risking their lives. And you know, if we lose, we will have we have we will have lost after having waged um, the good fight. The question is, what will you know our current mayor, who inherited this injustice, do about um, this case and about widespread displacement and predatory use of um, property law in the Black Mecca. It's not the Black Mecca if you're putting people out. It's not the Black Mecca if people are being displaced and can't afford to live um, within the city limits. It's not the Black Mecca if Black people can only work here but live south of the city. Um, we shall see. Uh, our mayor is aware of this issue and we are hopeful that she will uh, address it um, in a responsible and conscientious way. We actually went to visit um, President-elect Biden when he was uh, campaigning in South Carolina. This is when he, when his campaign took a turn and um, he began to position himself as the nominee and now he is the president-elect. And I have this video that I want to show that um, captures what our expectation is after that meeting. So I'm going to stop the share and then open the video. One second. Yep. Okay, I'm going to do the share again. Thank you for bearing with me. Awesome. Lakita, can you see it? You see the blank screen? Yes. No, I see the video. Dear Vice yeah. President Joe Biden, my neighbor and I are writing to you today in hopes that you remember our meeting back in Spartanburg, South Carolina on February 28th. You looked me right in the eyes and promised to sit down with us and learn about our fight. We're Black mothers fighting an unlawful attempt to take our homes by eminent domain by your key surrogate Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Biden. We have lived in our historical black neighborhood, People's Town, for over 30 years and have spent the last seven years fighting displacement. Displacement is not just affecting the poor, it starts with the During this time, through the death of family members, health crisis, and mountain legal fees, we have staged citywide protests with members of the black clergy, state legislators, and housing activists asking Mayor Bottoms to let us stay, and yet she failed to address this. Our fight mirrors the struggle of many Black people across the United States who are being gentrified out of their community that they helped to build. I know you are compassionate and empathetic. The suffering you have endured over the course of your life allow you to connect with others who are suffering. On that day in Spartanburg, you said that the votes of the Black community are the key part of your path to the presidency. As Black mothers, the largest demographic facing eviction in America, we will be voting. I trust you can be a man of your word. So Joe, please keep your promise and meet with us.
Okay, let me make sure that it stops. Okay, excellent. So let me go back to my PowerPoint slides. Can you see that, Lakita? Yes. Excellent. I'm almost done because I really want to hear your questions and thoughts. Um, Miss Maddie, she passed away um, August 1st of this year. And um, what, I, is a, what I count as a blessing is that she passed away. She took her last breath in her house the way she wanted to. But it bothers me tremendously that she passed away concerned for whether her children would be able to hold on to the property in her memory. Um, because Mary granted her a reprieve, she, um, you know, the city never sued her. And so they will have to sue her if they want to acquire that property. Um, I hope that they won't. I hope that this comes to an end soon. Um, I hope that we're not going to be put out in the middle of a deadly pandemic um, where infection rates and death rates are increasing. Um, but the reality is that the pandemic has exacerbated eviction rates and it has not stopped gentrification. And so we are, we continue to live in a question mark. Um, we don't know what is going to happen. We're still paying our mortgage. Uh, our names are not on the deeds to our homes and we are at the mercy of Mayor Bottoms um, in terms of making a decision to allow us to stay and to stop um, the legal proceedings against us. Um, we're hopeful and you know, I, I expect that, that she's going to do the right thing. I just hope she does it quickly. Um, so what's next? We just, you know, we keep fighting. Because um, when we fight, we win. We also learn lessons that we can share so that other folks can fight. Um, because this is based on the article um, from the New York Times uh, published in March of this year this is going to happen in lots of cities with old infrastructure across the United States. There's a built-in public purpose when you have crumbling infrastructure. And so our neighborhoods, black and brown and working class neighborhoods are being targeted for this kind of predatory action. And I want people to be prepared. I don't want anyone to feel the way I feel some days when I pull up to my house and just don't know what the next day is going to bring. When they sued us, an eviction uh, dispossessory notice was attached to the complaint. So at any point in time, since October 31st, 2016, we could have been evicted and can be evicted. Um, so we just keep fighting and praying and standing together as community with other folks who are supporting us and um, telling our story so that people are aware of what's happening and can be aware if, if they start to feel that this is coming for them or their neighborhood or, or community. So with that, I thank you and open it up for questions, comments. Thank you, Tanya, that was great. I knew the first time I heard about your fight that we definitely needed to include you in this Freedom, Se this Freedom School series and you definitely did not disappoint. Thank you so much for sharing your fight and all of your knowledge that you have gained. And hopefully this can, as you say, not only bring awareness to what is going on, but also help other people who are in the fight. So at this time, if we have questions, you can place them in the Q&A and or the chat. I saw questions in the chat and I have them um, to ask Professor Washington. So there are a number of questions. Um, one question is what role, if any, does the built line play in gentrification? Well, projects that do not 
have, so there are lots of projects like the Beltline that have an ascribed percentage of affordable housing that is supposed to be built by the developers, right? So often, you know, I, it, the first step has to be that um, that amount is stated, that it's sufficient, and that we're defining affordable housing um, in ways that mirror what people are earning, right? So affordable housing to me is not a one bedroom apartment that costs $1,200. That's, that's just not affordable. And it's certainly not gonna be affordable for a family of four or a family with children. And so we see projects like the Gulch, we see projects like um, the Beltline where there's a certain amount of affordable housing, but we need to be careful about how that term is used and what the, um, what the um, rental rate is for what they consider to be affordable housing. We also need to look at the amount, the length of time that that kind of housing has to be provided for. It could be five years, it could be 10 years, it could be 99 years. That amount of time is going to be important. And we also need to figure out if there are enforcement mechanisms if a developer fails to provide the promised amount of affordable housing. And so there have been, um, there's been controversy surrounding the Beltline, um, particularly with respect to that enforcement piece. If developers don't provide the amount of, housing, are there enforcement policies that have teeth? Or is it economically worth it for a developer not to provide affordable housing, pay a fine, but make more money renting units at market rate? Thank you. Um, one of the questions from a an attendee is, um, kind of in line with this, right? And so one of the things you ended your presentation with is the role that you hope Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms plays in um, your fight for your home and the fight for your neighbor's home. And so this person asks, is it true that Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is being considered in Vice President Biden cabinet as housing secretary? And if so, how can, um, they're basically questioning how can Biden consider a mayor whose administration is under multiple federal investigations and Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms has a history of the biggest displacement of Black families in Atlanta, Georgia. So I have heard um, several news broadcasts reporting that she is being considered for a cabinet position and housing um, in particular. And I think that's consistent with her, rep her uh, reputation as housing mayor. I've heard people refer to her as that uh, during her term. Um, I think it is problematic if we look at all those statistics that I started with that reflect realities that have occurred during her term as mayor. Mm -hmm. That has to be part of the record that's considered when you're talking about putting someone in that position at this particular time where people are being evicted all across the nation because of the pandemic and it's a public health, health crisis, we really need someone with a demonstrated track record of caring about the least of these because that's who's suffering right now. And by all accounts, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. We need people to have housing so that they are not vulnerable to contracting the disease. Um, shelters are not safe. Living on the street is not safe. And so we need somebody with a demonstrated track record is, who's going to implement policies that are directly focused on alleviating this suffering. And I don't know if uh, Mayor Bottoms' track record recommends her for that position. I guess we shall see. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question is, and you kind of talk about this some, but can you explain more the role of the expansion of GSU um, in this idea of gentrification within the city of Atlanta? So um, Georgia State University has a strategic plan and one of the goals, I can't remember if it's goal three or goal four, speaks to um, addressing the some of the uh, biggest problems facing you know, urban areas. And one of the biggest problems, problems facing urban, urban areas is gentrification. And so when the um, university put forth a proposal to purchase Turner Field, what the community asked for, and they asked this of City Hall, was 
um, that a community benefits agreement be part of the request for proposals mm -hmm. so that people who wanted to purchase Turner Field would do so knowing that they had to comply with certain things that were stated, contractually comply with things that were stated that reflected what the community wanted as part of that transaction. Um, and the city did not make the community benefits agreement part of that request for proposals. And so Georgia State, when it purchased the property, had no obligation mm -hmm. to respond to, to what the community needs. Um, the community was incredibly disappointed because we often get researchers in People's Town doing all sorts of funded research by faculty at Georgia State. And if you're using the population for your work, then there's an obligation to be a good neighbor, right? And to respond to some of the needs of the community into which you are moving. And that hasn't happened. It's not too late. You know, the university has an opportunity as it expands its footprint in that neighborhood to be a good neighbor and to collaborate with the community. And I hope that that is what we will do as an institution. Another question is what court makes the final decision? Um, is your request to the mayor to withdraw this, the suit? So we, ha we have asked the mayor to withdraw the suit. Um, the city has spent a lot of money. Um, at last count, it was $200,000 litigating this. Um, countless hours by, uh, you know, city, of, city hall staff and also the uh, billable hours of outside counsel. So we would hope that they would withdraw the lawsuits um, and then do whatever they need to do with that block. Mm -hmm. with the land that they have. Um, we were in Superior Court. We are waiting for a jury trial on the just compensation question. Even though we're not interested in selling our homes, we're interested in um, staying and being left alone. Um, but we can't appeal it until after we have that jury trial. And as many of you may know, jury trials were put on hold in March. We, our jury trials had not yet been scheduled, but jury trials were put on hold in March. And I think they're going to resume in at the end of this month, but there's a backlog of eight months for the jury trials that were postponed. Ours has yet to be scheduled. So we're in a whole, you know, we're in purgatory, mm -hmm. waiting for the process to play out so we can, you know, if, if we're not successful, we can appeal um, to the appellate court and ultimately to the Georgia Supreme Court and possibly to the U.S. Supreme Court if it comes to that. Okay. Um, you mentioned, this is my own personal question, uh, about the tactics of, uh, about the fact that if this was 50 years ago, you would not even be able to have this fight and you cited places like Rosewood and Tulsa. Um, but this process um, that you're talking about as far as taxes and the increase on taxes is something that, it, that we have seen um, impact Blacks in, in, in more legal ways, right? Mm -hmm. And we've seen it primarily on the coast of South Carolina and yeah. Georgia. How would this, um, how would staying in your home, could you detail how staying in your home would impact the um, economic prosperity of Black families if they were able to keep their homes? So, you know, obviously, you know, your home is, um, you know, the place that you lay your head and, you know, you have a, an emotional attachment to it, but it's also a financial asset. Um, it is also part of Black wealth, right? Um, my mother often reminds me that land is in short supply. God's not creating any more of it. And there appears to be, as I look at the increased use of eminent domain and some of these other tools um, for displacement, there seems to be a land grab going on. Mm -hmm. And um, heirs property is another way that lots of black families are losing land. It's titled in everybody's name, cousins and uncles, and nobody is maintaining it. And in Georgia, then it becomes blighted and it's subject to eminent domain takings. There's all of these ways that um, the amount of land that Black people have is strategically being diminished. 
And so we need to be aware of this. I would like to be able to leave my home to my children, right? So they don't ever have to worry about, no matter how bad the economy is, at least they have a home. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't have that, then we're losing generational wealth. And so we have to fight to keep the wealth that our families have been able to attain. And I think it also decimates our communities. You know, we had a community that it wasn't just houses, these were families and, you know, people who with shared experiences. I, you know, would visit my families, uh, my neighbors' homes and, you know, um, babysitting and carpooling and like all the things that make a community a community. When um, gentrification displaces people, where do, pe where do people's social and um, familial and support networks go? What happens to that? And there's also been some research around the health effects of displacement. I saw that with Miss Maddie, you know, the stress of believing that she was going to be displaced um, took a toll on her physically and emotionally and mentally. And when you displace people from the networks that help to define them and their existence, then you do damage not just to the community, but to the individual person that's targeted. Okay, another question is pertaining to your fighting. Um, I don't understand how the city was able to take your names off of your deeds. So the question is how were they legally able to take your name off the deeds and does that work against your case? Um, that's a great question. So the law allows it, right? It's the most aggressive tool. There are other things they could have done. They could have um, sued us and then we could have fought over who owned the property while we still owned it before a magistrate court judge. But they used the most aggressive form of taking called declaration of taking method where they take the property up front, sue you, you become a defendant. Mm -hmm. and, and you're at a disadvantage fighting defensively against the taking, which is presumptively necessary. Um, so that's how it affects you because you're now in a defensive posture of having been sued, working with these really tight deadlines um, and timelines and working against a presumption that your home was necessary. And so in your fight, when you, when they take your home without you approving it, then you don't even qualify for the just compensation aspect, right? Well, you can still, after the, the question of the taking uh, and the legality of the taking is litigated, you do get to fight for just compensation. You get to fight for what your house is worth as of the time that it was taken, mm -hmm. right? So the, the 350 or $375,000, I can't remember what the exact amount is because I'm not interested, um, that they put in escrow is not enough, as I said, for me to move across the street in 2020 into the $650,000 house across the street. And we're talking 50 yards from where I live. So just compensation, it sounds just and fair but it's not enough to move in a comparable home in a comparable neighborhood. Thank you. Another question that is along those same lines is someone's wondering if you could tell us how much the city paid for the homes that were um, taken from the homeowners. So it's a matter of public record. I don't remember exactly how much each homeowner got. Um, there was, and there were two groups of folks. There were the folks who sued the city. And so they settled for an amount for the value of their home. And they also settled, um, the settlement also included the amount of property damage caused by the flooding, right? Because those are the people who sued the city. Um, and then there was the group whose homes didn't flood, but who decided that they were going to settle with the city because it wasn't worth it. It was gonna be expensive, time consuming. I understand why people don't fight because it takes a lot. It takes a toll on your psyche on your time, certainly um, it's expensive. We owe over $300,000 to our engineers and our lawyers. Mm -hmm. That's what we owe for the four years of litigation. Um, so I understand why people don't 
fight because it's expensive and the chances of winning are slim to none. But the people who settled, um, whose homes hadn't flooded and they weren't part of the lawsuit, I encouraged them to get their own uh, appraisals um, because the, some of the city's appraisals were coming in 30 and $40,000 less than what an independent appraiser, appraiser hired by the property owner um, was uh, the value of the home um, was more, was assessed at a higher value by those independent appraisers. And so they settled for you know, some, somewhere as low as $120,000. Some of them were as high as 330. And again, that was in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Okay. Um, can you talk about how opportunity zones are impacting Atlanta? So the little bit that I know about opportunity zones um, is probably informed by uh, what I know about empowerment zones. Um, and, you know, there's zones that are targeted for certain tax incentives um, to encourage folks to move in. Um, and I think they're often supposed to be designed to help um, black people and working class people in certain areas where they want to encourage developers and other folks to make an investment, mm -hmm. but they can often and have been criticized as facilitating um, gentrification um, because the investments aren't necessarily being made for the current residents. They're being made for the residents they anticipate will come to that area. Okay, thank you. Um, is gentrification done through elected politicians, builders, property organizations, and bankers collaborating together? I think there's a part of it that is intentional and collaborative um, by some of the stakeholders that were mentioned in that question. But I also think that it's something that we have to, and elected officials have to intentionally challenge with policies that don't allow it to just happen, mm -hmm. right? We need to make sure that a certain amount of new housing that's being built is affordable where the AMI is zero to 30, not 80 to 120, and you end up with one bedroom that costs $1,200 a month. Right, we need policies to make sure it doesn't happen rather than it happening as a default when those policies are not in place. And I think, you know, when we have elections, we need to ask the tough questions. Um, we need to ask people what they intend to do, but we also need to research their records because the best indication of what somebody will do is what they've already done. So if they have a track record of voting for projects and voting against policies, that um, frustrate displacement and facilitate uh, gentrification, then we need to be aware of that when we're voting for elected officials. Speaking of that, your video for Biden um, was brilliant. Have you sent it to him? Have you all heard anything from him about having a possible meeting as of yet? We have not, and thank you. Um, we had a wonderful, I mean, we've had so many people, I just have to give a, a, a shout out to the, the um, videographer, Zach Norton, who put that together. Um, you know, he volunteered his time and created that and we are trying to get it out there so that, you know, it is shared. We would love for it to come to um, President-elect Biden's attention. Um, because we think it's important for him to know that our story is emblematic of the story of so many Black people and Black women with kids in particular who are experiencing, um, you know, the threat of being evicted in the middle of a pandemic. But thank you. That, kind of, that goes in line with my next question. What are some ways citizens can get involved? So I encourage you to put it in chat um, so um, citizens can share. But can you Tell us some other ways in which citizens can get involved in this um, fight within Atlanta, either with your community or even with their own. Um, and a part two of that, as you're putting it in the chat, uh, chat is um, what are some tactics to fight gentrification if you see it beginning in your neighborhood? Um, organize, organize, organize. Um, we started 
organizing long before um, we were sued, long before a lawsuit was, you know, the expectation. Um, and being informed about what your rights are and what protections are available make people follow the rules. So I one example that I give is getting involved and being aware of what is happening at City Hall, um, particularly with these zoning um, ordinances, going to those zoning meetings, paying attention because they give the addresses, they give the areas where developers or other individuals are applying for changes in the zoning laws is for a particular purpose. Look at the 20 year plan that is on file for all neighborhoods. Like these things don't just happen. It's part of a strategic plan. And if we know what the plan is, then we can also identify the points of intervention. Um, and the, the other thing that I've learned um, because I was, you know, I was a law professor. I, I taught about gentrification in my race law class. I certainly was sympathetic to the reality of its, its existence, but I had never experienced it. So this experience was, uh, you know, came to my doorstep literally. Mm -hmm. And um, as we discover these things, we need to share the information and we also need to act collectively, right? Um, collective resistance is incredibly powerful. Um, and so attending our neighborhood association meetings, uh, NPU meetings, talking to our neighbors, like I found out about the insurance um, schemes because I was at a community um, neighborhood meeting and three different people told me the same story, not having spoken to each other and with different insurers. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to discern the patterns if you're not communicating with your neighbors. Okay, um, to follow with that, what are the ways that folks who are not in, in the community support this fight, i.e. letter writing, donations, social media support? And also, can you list some of the organizations that people can get involved with? Yes, um, the one that I really, really, really wanna highlight at the outset is Housing Justice League. They have done a lot of work. Um, they have produced an incredible, um, eviction manual, which provides um, detailed and easily accessible information about how to protect yourself from uh, an unlawful eviction. They also can provide resources um, for challenging um, unlawful evictions. And they've just been doing this work for a very long time and have helped a lot of people like myself and my neighbors to um, resist predatory use of law. Um, Georgia Stand Up has also been incredibly helpful. Um, they are a think act tank that works on behalf of communities, communities of color, black communities in particular. And joining these organizations and supporting these organizations financially and, and also um, through donations of time and energy is um, is critical because we would not, I am very clear that, but for the support of organizations like Housing Justice League, we would not still be in our house, houses. We were supposed to be gone in 2016. Mm -hmm. So as much as we are still behind the eight ball, every day that I wake up in my house and go to bed in my house, it is a victory. Yes. And I have to take um, you know, just draw strength from that. Thank you. Um, another question, are community land trusts a viable strategy to resist gentrification? Under what circumstances are they useful and do they work in Atlanta? I think they can work in Atlanta. I don't know of any examples that I can point to where they have been successful, but I really like the collective aspect of the ownership um, that means if, if people are um, coming for that property, there are more people invested in um, making sure that the property is maintained in a way that it may, that it's not subject to code enforcement. It's, you know, it's not subject to the insurance schemes that are going on, that um, people can organize themselves 
in such a way that the land is owned by the community. People have housing on that land. And if a neighbor is experiencing a particular challenge, then other co-owners can step in and provide financial support until that person can get back on their feet and everyone is making an investment in the ownership of that property. And there are you know, different ways that people own property. If we look at um, indigenous rights and indigenous con conceptions of property. It's owned by the, you know, by the nation. It's not owned by individuals. And so the, the concept of the land trust is old, right? It's, it's um, indigenous to a number of cultures. Um, Mexican-Americans owned property as families and as groups, which frustrated their ability to protect it when you know, uh, the colonists decided they wanted to take it and they need individual deeds, right? All of the requirements for preserving your property were codified in, in ways that um, Westerners, that were aligned with the Western concept of owning property. And so the land trust to me um, is, is, is an, a, a way to protect property and also to preserve it as a community asset. Thank you. Um, are there any final words? I think I've gotten through all of the questions. So are there any final words you would like to leave us with? Just thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Bennett Bailey, to share my story. Um, it's therapeutic for me. This has been hard, but um, what makes it uh, worth it is knowing that as I share with others, maybe um, it's less likely to happen to other people or people will be prepared or feel more comfortable resisting um, because we need to make sure that, um, that when communities and individuals are facing this kind of threat that they don't feel hopeless and powerless. Yes. Thank you, Professor Washington. This has been great. I am, I, every time I do these talks, I learn so much from the presenters um, that are presenting. So thank you very much. This has been very informative. And I know our audience, um, you have comments when you have a chance to look through your chat uh, of people saying thank you and that this is brilliant and all of that. So that should also help you yes. um, <laughs> keep going um, and keep keeping the fight. So. Definitely, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. And again, we will have, um, we would like to thank the Auburn Avenue Research Library for uh, partnering with us to host these Freedom School series. Our next talk will be next Friday at 7 p.m. where we'll have Dr. Jonathan Gales um, discussing, discussing Black masculinity. And we have a whole slate of people for the spring semester as well. I found a talk this semester will be Maurice Hobson, which I believe is on December 4th. And he will be talking about the Red Dog Police in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, thank you. Thank you, Auburn Avenue Research Library. And also thank you, Department of African-American Studies for co-sponsoring this. And I have done what my chair is always getting on me for doing. I did not introduce myself, but I am Lakita Barnett Bailey, an associate professor in the Department of African American Studies. Thank you all and good night. Have a great weekend. Be safe. You too. Bye. Bye.